Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my update vlog for July 2019, and as you can see, I'll be covering some general updates, as well as the shifting shelf, where I talk about the new games I got, and the games I potentially got rid of, as well as my upcoming schedule for the next four weeks on the channel. Now, before we jump in, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel, and also, if you would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. You will see a variety of ways with which you can support the channel there, and there are some pretty cool things that go along with some of those, including voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Now, uh, speaking of support, I'm going to do a quick Patreon uh, update for the last four weeks. 14 new people added into the campaign, which is really great to see. Uh, overall, the levels went up uh, just a little bit, because there were quite a few people who actually uh, fell off of the campaign over the last month, and that's just a standard thing. So, in general, um, things are going well, and thank you so much to all 14 of the new supporters of the channel. Now, at this point, we can go go into the main updates, and the first one is probably the biggest one, and that's that I went to Origins for the first time this year. Um, I've heard about Origins for, I don't know, eight or nine years at this point, you know, being in the hobby and uh, paying attention to things and whatnot. You always hear about Gen Con, and then in the same sentence, I usually also heard about Origins, and I've also heard a lot of people talk about, well, should I go to Gen Con or should I go to Origins? And this year, there was a, a bit of a scheduling uh, conflict for me to go to Gen Con, and I said, you know what? This seems like a good opportunity to try Origins out. So I uh, booked uh, a Airbnb that was just like an eight-minute walk away from the convention, and I did that like five weeks before the convention actually started. So it was uh, really not that bad. And I think it was only like $110 a night. Uh, so really uh, not bad as far as getting some somewhat last minute accommodations to try and go to Origins. Now, um, I ended up uh, flying out there on the Wednesday, and I think technically the show goes Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I flew out Wednesday, and I arrived at like 6 o'clock or so, because, of course, I'm on uh, I'm in California, so whenever I fly east, the uh, time zone changes really can mess with things. So even though the flight was, um, I was only in the air for like, I don't know, four and a half, five hours, or maybe six, either way, I don't remember the details, it was more like a nine-hour change because of the time, uh, time difference. Uh, either way, I got in there, and I was able to right away just go into the convention, get my badge, and start meeting people. Uh, funnily enough, actually, I walked into the, the front doors of Origins for the first time ever, and I'm like, ah, just looking around, and boom, the first thing you see is my friend Frank West. Uh, he is uh, the person behind the uh, publishing company, uh, uh, The City of Games, and uh, he's from England, and we've met a few times in the past, and uh, we've played a ton of games. And <laughs> the first thing I see is my friend from England, so it was kind of funny. I ended up bumping into him like five or six times throughout the convention, and I think that speaks a little bit to the size of this convention. So I had heard that Origins is obviously a lot smaller than Gen Con and some of the other conventions that I've gone to, but the previous, um, I guess, larger conventions I've been to over the last couple of years is Essenspiel twice and uh, UK Games Expo that I went to last year. So when I showed up to Origins, I was um, a little bit surprised, actually, at how small everything kind of felt, and I think that's mostly me. Like, I had an expectation maybe that, well, maybe not even an expectation, but just my data set is that the last few larger conventions I've been to have been humongous. I mean, obviously, Essen Spiel is, like, the biggest one in the world, and there are, uh, like, 70,000 people go to that or something crazy, so going to Origins, and I think it had like 18,000 people show up this year, uh, was a significant difference, and I think I just kind of wasn't really mentally um, prepared for that. So I walked around, and I was like, oh wow, this is like really cozy. Like, the overall convention center was nowhere near as big as uh, Gen Con either, but one thing I noticed is that it seemed like a lot happened there at the convention hall uh, compared to, you know, when I went to Gen Con and the two times I've been to Essen Spiel. In those situations, it seemed like you went to the convention, uh, uh, halls to, you know, go to the exhibitors and maybe go to um, uh, some scheduled events or that kind of thing, and then you leave the hall and you go somewhere else, like a hotel or something like that, to play games. Now, when it come to came to Origins, it seemed like people just kind of hung out in the overall hall space um, almost all night. Uh, there were a couple nights where uh, we wandered around uh, just through the main hallways, you know, like the arteries of this convention hall, um, where you could, you know, branch off to go into exhibitor halls and whatnot, and it would be 11 o'clock at night, and there would be people playing games on the tables right out there. Now, it's possible that's the case at Gen Con and Essence Spiel. Well, I don't think it's the case at Essence Spiel. I think they actually close that place down and kick everybody out. Um, but my memory of Gen Con is a couple years old, but just it seemed like 
things were just a little bit warmer and a little bit more laid back at Origins, especially compared to Gen Con. I think a big reason for that is because there's a lot less humongous releases at Gen Con, at, at Origins, that is, compared to Gen Con. So it seemed like people were much more there to play the games that they had, uh, play some of the new games, but it was not just a uh, desperate, um, uh, you know, running towards uh, specific spots to get these specific things that uh, are brand new. So I liked the overall um, just kind of vibe of the convention more than my experience with Gen Con. Um, and a big part of that's also because I came um, from a professional perspective because I had a bunch of meetings that I had scheduled with a bunch of publishers. And instead of, you know, trying to uh, grab their ear on my scheduled meeting and discuss, you know, covering their games on the channel and whatnot while they have a line of people around the booth and it's just crazy. Well, at Origins, there were a couple times where the publishers were like, yeah, come over here, let's like play a game and then talk about it and just, you know, a much more laid back environment. So overall, I had a good time at Origins. I, I enjoyed the... Um, the food that was there, um, especially compared to Gen Con, there is this kind of, th this place called the North Market that's just like a five minute walk from the convention hall. And it's an indoors market with a bunch of different stalls in it. And they had this uh, ice cream spot that was amazing. I think it was called Jenny's Ice Cream and they had all sorts of crazy flavors. Uh, the one I liked the most was goat cheese and black forest cherry, I think, or something like that. It was amazing. <laughs> I went there a couple times and there was just a wide variety of other spots in there. And even in the middle of lunch rush, it was not that hard to get your food in like 10 to 15 minutes. And again, that was not the case I found at all when I was at Gen Con um, and certainly not at Essence Spiel. Oh my gosh, you could wait like 25 minutes just to get a tiny little hot dog in, at Essence. So um, I definitely uh, enjoyed that part about it. And also, I mean, circling back to the beginning, I was able to get decent accommodations uh, for a very reasonable price, very close to the convention. Now, of course, I used Airbnb. I did not use the hotels. I looked into those and they were like, you know, more than $200 a night. And I'm trying to save a little bit of money here when I'm going out to these things. But it was just, um, just in general, a really pleasant experience. I enjoyed going to Origins and I think it's possible I might end up going to it in the future. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be a go to it every year type of convention for me, but honestly, I try to only go to like three or so conventions a year. And so, you know, even Gen Con is not an every year convention and Essence Spiel isn't either. I'm not going to be going to that one this year because I really need to kind of space things out and use my time and money appropriately, and I cannot just go to all of the conventions. That's just not the kind of lifestyle that I'm looking to lead. Um, either way, that's going to wrap up my thoughts on Origins 2019, and now the other update that I want to talk about is the experiment. Now, uh, about a month ago, I published two of these vlogs pretty much back to back. I did a variety vlog, and then two weeks later, I did an update vlog, essentially saying that I'm going to be trying things out to break my variety vlogs up into a lot of little vlogs to try and put out maybe one a week and see if people engage with that more. Now, the original plan was I would do that update vlog, and then I would do a Q&A vlog. I was going to do a games to watch vlog, and then an impressions vlog, kind of just splitting things up. And I ended up kind of missing out on a couple of those. Uh, part of that is because things just got crazy. Uh, obviously, Origins happened in the middle of this, and then when I got home from Origins, the next day, I started to get a little bit of a cough, and the day after that, I was running 103 degree fever, and I had that for a couple days, and then the few days after that, the fever kind of went down, but I still felt awful. I essentially lost four straight days of productivity that I was going to be filming with, and it was a bit rough. Um, <laughs> Jessica actually helped me out a little bit, like taking on some of my workload because I had had some really hard deadlines. And then she started to get sick at the same time because, you know, I'm getting sick and maybe it was the same thing. Either way, it was just a rough couple of weeks uh, with being gone and then just being back and being not very productive at all. And one of the things that I had to give was well, this vlog experiment to a certain extent. So I am going to continue doing this experiment. Obviously, I'm doing an update vlog right now, and I am planning on putting out a games to watch or games radar vlog. I'm not sure which. I didn't end up making one last month, so I didn't actually have to commit to a name for that. Um, and that is where I'm going to talk about all of the new games that I've learned about. And uh, I am planning on putting that one out next week. But I can talk about that stuff in the uh, the, the schedule part that's coming up later. Um, either way, when it comes to the um, the vlog part of the experiment, I think things went okay. I did make one pre-recorded Q&A and there was a lot of engagement there. Now, I think part of that is because one of the questions that I got had to do with paid versus unpaid reviews. And there's a lot of attention on that right now in uh, the board gaming hobby. And so I think that also drew a lot of attention to get a lot of comments over there. I'm curious about the future. But I did mention in my last vlog, the last update, that I'm hoping to do some live Q&A vlogs. And uh, with everything that happened in June, there was just no way to fit that in. Now, I'm hoping that I might be able to do one of those 
shows in July, but I'm not committing to it at this point. Um, there's quite a few logistical things going on this month as well that are kind of hampering things down. But either way, I think the other uh, experiment to really talk about has to do with the playthroughs. Um, I guess to a certain extent, this is the much bigger experiment. And again, this is where I decided to not have the entire playthrough and tutorial within one video. I now just did the tutorial, taught about 90% of the rules, and then stopped and then made another video to play out the rest of the game. Now at this point, I think I've done like five or so of those, and I think everybody has liked it. <laughs> uh, let me know if you have disliked it. There, there have been a couple of people who mentioned that it was like, slightly annoying, but they always said right after that, but they understood why I'm doing it. And they are hopeful that this is going to um, allow the channel to grow a little bit more, get more engagement because people will be less afraid of like a two hour timestamp on a video. They're like, oh, 35 minutes. I have 35 minutes to spare. And then maybe if I hook them with the game, you know, they're like, ooh, what's gonna happen? Then maybe they go over and watch the extended one. Um, it's been a little bit interesting to look at the metrics there. I'm not um, exactly sure if I have seen more views uh, with the uh, split up of the tutorial. But one thing I have been able to see is the view count on the tutorial versus the view count on those extended playthroughs. In general, it seemed like about one third, uh, there's about one third of the views on the extended playthrough. So one in three people clicked through to watch the extended playthrough. And then obviously not all of those people watched the entire extended playthrough, but I think that's a pretty good uh, number set. I think, you know, two out of three people watching just the tutorial to say, okay, I have a feeling about how the game works. I know most of the rules. I got to see a turn or two to see like all of the, the general cycle of the game and that's good enough for me and they walk away and I think that's just fine. Um, so yeah, I'm going to continue with this um, experiment. I guess it's going to become less of an experiment as I continue to do it. Um, I can say that it seems like nothing is really telling me to stop doing this and to go back to my old ways. And from a personal perspective, I have enjoyed this change. Now, one thing uh, that I was not exactly expecting to happen is that the tutorials are a little bit longer than I was uh, planning on. In general, I felt like it was going to be like, oh, most of them will be 18 minutes, maybe 25 minutes long. But I found that since I am trying to teach most of the rules in that tutorial, I am sometimes teaching rules that I might have taught in like the hour 10 mark or the hour 15 mark or the 45 minute mark. Now I'm trying to really shoehorn those in and make sure those happen in the tutorial bit, which means the tutorials have actually averaged more like 30 minutes. But I think in general, that's that's just fine. Like that's something I wasn't necessarily expecting. But it also means when I get to the extended playthrough part, I feel like I'm playing through it a little bit quicker. Uh, one thing I'm trying to do is just film these videos quicker. Um, on average, I spend like seven to eight hours filming each one of these videos, and that's just a lot of time. So if I can film these quicker, that would be good. So consolidating the rules into one chunk, and then when I get to the extended playthrough part, I just say, all right, let's just play the game and see what happens. And uh, that in general has gone a little bit better. So um, I'm pretty hopeful about some of the changes that I made. It's always exciting making some changes and to see how those uh, changes kind of affect the overall status quo that I have because it's very easy to get locked in to doing the same thing over and over again. And uh, yeah, I'm going to continue doing all of those things in the future and I'm going to try to keep my eyes open for potential other small tweaks that I can do to uh, try and continually make the stuff that I make better. All right, let's now move on to the next segment, which is the shifting shelf. Now, this is where I talk about the new games that I acquired over the last month and all of the games I had to remove from my collection to make room. But as you'll notice, I did not remove any. Now, that is 25 new games that I got this month. And funnily enough, I removed exactly 25 games last month when I uh, was trying to prepare for the uh, Victory Point Cafe flea market. Now, uh, that flea market went very well and I had lots of holes in my collection. So now I was able to put all of these in without removing anything. But I think it's very, very likely that Many games are going to get removed, starting even in the uh, next update vlog that's going to be happening in four weeks or so. Now let's go ahead and jump in and uh, briefly talk about these 25 games. The first one is Adventureland, and this one is from Haba Games. Now while I was at Origins, I had a scheduled meeting with T from uh, Haba Games, and they are a friend of mine, actually. Uh, we've known each other for like five years or so now. Uh, they had a, uh, a YouTube channel that they worked on for quite a while, and I'm not sure if they're still doing it. But either way, um, they got this job that uh, working at Haba for, um, I'm not sure the exact title, but they're in charge of a lot of the marketing and a lot of the working with other um, people who make content. So uh, that was really great to meet them. And uh, they gave me tons of games. So one of them was Adventureland, which I don't know much about. Uh, it's a fully cooperative game, I think. Actually, I'm not sure about that. I'm not gonna commit to it. I have not played it yet. So that's one of the many games 
games that I got from Haba. Uh, the next game I got is Bosk, and this one comes from Floodgate Games. I did not have a scheduled meeting with them at Origins, but I was wandering throughout the exhibit hall, and I kind of made eye contact with the person at the booth, and I kind of it's like, oh, do I know you? And we walked over, and um, I guess we shook hands. I think we met before, and we talked about Bosk, and they gave me a press copy, and I have now uh, covered my impressions of it, actually, in the impressions vlog that I just did, uh, that I put out a few d days ago, or last week, or who knows, <laughs> years ago, depending on when you're watching this video. Uh, I quite liked it, but definitely look at the impressions vlog to see more uh, details on that. I also got a copy of Caravan, which is a new game that's coming out from Rio Grande Games. I got to play a demo of this at Origins, and I thought it was pretty cool. It had a lot of uh, simple uh, rules, but some somewhat interesting decisions that came from them. And at this point, I have now played a full game of it, and I'll be covering my impressions of that in the next Impressions vlog that'll come out in like three weeks or so. Um, I also picked up Carcassonne. <laughs> now, this game is not new at all. I think it came out in like 2001 or something, and this is a game that I have always liked. I think it's a brilliant two-player game. Game, and I like it at three and four players as well. And I was at the Victory Point Cafe flea market and the cafe itself was selling a copy for 10 bucks. And I was like, you know what? I should have Carcassonne. I, I, there have been many times where I'm like, I wouldn't mind playing Carcassonne right now. Um, and now I have that opportunity to do. I haven't actually yet, but this is just a classic that I, I really quite enjoy, so I'm glad I have. Uh, next up, we have Curios, which is a new game from AEG, and I did cover my impressions of this one in the last impressions vlog, so feel free to check that one out. Um, this one is a very light, quick game of resource acquisition, but you don't actually know what, what the resources are worth until the end of the game, so you're trying to do some light deduction as well. Moving on, we have Darwin's Choice, and I don't know much about this game beyond the fact that you are building out monsters by kind of putting cards next to each other, like, you know, a kangaroo head on a whale with, you know, bird wings or something like that. Um, that's kind of all I know at this point. I haven't actually read the rules. They decided to send me a, a media copy to try out uh, for the Impressions vlog. I just haven't had a chance to read through the rules. Uh, next up, we have a Dino World, which I also got from Hava Games while I was at Origins. I have not played this one yet. It looks like it's a very light uh, kid-style game where you actually actually are uh, kind of flicking cards off of the top of um, your box. Like you put the box up there and you're flicking off and you're trying to have them land on different uh, dinosaurs. And depending on the size of the dinosaurs, you are going to uh, be able to eat them or not eat them. And that's pretty much the extent of the game. Um, this is one that I'm probably going to be holding on to to play with some nieces and nephews at some point in the future. Uh, Dragon's Breath is another game that I got from Haba. <laughs> like I said, they just gave me so many games. I was like, I'm not sure if I can cover all of these. And they're like, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, so I haven't played this one just yet. Um, but the uh, this looks like it has a neat mechanical gimmick where you stack this set of clear plastic rings and then you put a whole bunch of different gems inside them. And then you slowly pull off the rings and the gems kind of fall out onto the board. And that's the extent of what I know about the game. I have not read the rules yet. I'm not sure what you do with those gems when they fall down, but that's kind of a neat idea. I think thematically you are melting some frozen gems and you're kind of pulling off the rings to show the ice melting. Um, I'm curious to try this one out at some point. Uh, next up, we have Dungeon Academy, and this one was sent to me by the OP, or the OP. Uh, they're uh, the, the company that used to be USAopoly. They've recently rebranded, and uh, this is a roll-and-write dungeon-style uh, delving game. Um, it, it's kind of like Boggle, the roll-and-write dungeon delving game, because you roll a 4x4 grid of dice, and then you try to delve through the dungeon in real time simultaneously with everybody else. I have played this one, but I have not covered my impressions yet. I played this one right after I did that last vlog, so I will talk um, at greater in greater detail for this one in just a few weeks in the next Impressions vlog. Uh, moving on, we have Exit, the Catacombs of Horror. Now, this is another one of those Exit uh, games. Uh, these are kind of escape room type games where you destroy the, co the components as you're making your way through the puzzles. Now, we have really enjoyed most of the Exit games, and I saw this one at the Cosmos booth while at Origins. Now, uh, I actually bought this one. It didn't feel like it made sense to try and get a uh, press copy of a game that will be destroyed because I can't really talk about it too much because I'll give spoilers. And I haven't played this one yet, but I do want to mention it because the reason that I got excited is because this is the first big box exit game. It's about twice as big as all of the other boxes. And it's actually two different exit games in one box that are thematically connected or maybe actually mechanically connected. I don't know. We haven't played it just yet, but we like exit. So it seemed like a no brainer to go ahead and pick this one up, especially considering it's a bigger experience. Like maybe this is one that we, we sit down to say, okay, this is going to take, you know, two or maybe two and a half, something like that hours instead of the usual hour that you sit down to play with with these. So I'm curious to try that one out. Um, next up, we have Fresco. Now, this game is not new at all. I haven't done my research, so I forget exactly uh, when this one came out. I feel like 
maybe like 2011 or something like that. But uh, this is a game that I've always enjoyed. Every time I play this one, I've loved it. And I was able to do a trade for this one from one of uh, the people who was at the Victory Point Cafe flea market. I don't remember what I traded for it, but I'm just happy to have this one in the collection. I think it's a wonderful light to medium weight euro of um, trying to paint out a fresco. And it's got a wonderful action selection mechanism where you decide what you're going to do behind a screen. And one of the major decisions you have to make every turn is what time you wake up in the morning to go down to the market in order to buy your paint. Uh, it's just a wonderful little game, and I'm looking forward to playing this one more now that I own a copy. Uh, next up, we have Huel Doc Mau Mau. Now, I played this one at Gamma earlier this year, and this is a really simple game. It's kind of like um, Uno to a certain extent, where you have a hand of cards, and they have colors and numbers. And when you play a card down, it has to either match the color or the number. But then, um, if either of your opponents has a matching color or number to the card you're trying to play, you have to play it on them instead. And every card is worth points equal to the value on it. So it's a game where you're trying to put cards into your discard pile, but you're sometimes forced to put it into your opponent's discard piles. There's some other kind of cool things going on here. I've played this one a couple times, um, and I'm not sure if I covered it in my impressions back when I played it at Gamma. I've done very little research for this vlog, sorry. Uh, but either way, I have played this one again. If I haven't covered my impressions, then I will cover those impressions in the in the future. Uh, moving on, we have Karuba the Card Game. Uh, this is a game we played like three times at BGGCon last year, I believe, uh, and we really liked it. And this is yet another game that was given to me at the Haba Games booth. Um, this one is is a uh, kind of simple distillation of the Karuba uh, type of game as you're trying to, in this case, build out some tile laying stuff in front of you. And I remember really liking it at Con. I don't remember all of the rules at this point, but I remember it was quite simple, and I'm looking forward to getting this one back to the table. Uh, moving on, we have Lady Richmond, which I know literally nothing about except for the fact that it's a Haba game, and they gave that one to me too. Uh, they were incredibly generous. <laughs> Moving on, we now have Legendary Forests, and this one I picked up from the Yellow Booth after I had a meeting with them, and I have covered my impressions of this one. It's actually a Karuba-style uh, tile-laying game, so it's got that kind of like one person pulls out a tile and everybody puts the same tile down, but it's even simpler than Karuba, and I liked it more than I expected. Um, so yeah, definitely check the impressions out for that one. And next we have Lighthouse Run. Now, I haven't played this one just yet, but I saw the game night um, gameplay uh, playthrough episode of this one that was posted on the Board Game Geek channel uh, just a couple months ago, and I was pretty intrigued by it. I had never heard of this game before. It's actually not that old. I think it's only a couple years old, and you are trying to get your uh, sailboats into a harbor before the storm comes in, but you can only move when there is a light coming from a lighthouse. Now, the lighthouses are these actual large uh, cardboard pieces, and you put little uh, tokens on the top to show if they are illuminated or not, and this is the type of game where sometimes you have to play cards to move yourself and move your opponents. Uh, so I'm looking forward to trying this one. I traded for this one from another person at the flea market. Uh, moving on, we have Pipeline, which is a heavy game from Capstone Games. Um, this one was actually just given to me by a friend. <laughs> uh, they backed it on Kickstarter, and then they read the rules once they got the game, and they're like, this game isn't for me. And they said, hey, John, do you want to try it? And I said, yeah, I definitely want to try this one. So um, I now have a copy of Pipeline. <laughs> uh, I played this one once, and I covered it my impressions of that one in the last vlog, and I talked about this one a lot. Um, it's a heavy game about trying to improve your crude oil by making a complicated tiling structure in front of yourself with all sorts of crazy pipes. Uh, moving on, we have Point Salad, which is another lightweight game coming from AEG. They sent this over to me because it's releasing at Gen Con, and I was able to play it and already cover my impressions of it. I, I actually quite enjoyed this one. And uh, moving on, we now have Raid on Takao. Now, this one was sent over to me about three weeks ago, and this is a fully cooperative game. I believe it's based in uh, Taiwan. Um, I, again, I really should have done more research for this vlog, uh, but it's a scenario-based cooperative game where you're going through various things are happening in a raid-style atmosphere. And I have not had a chance to play this one yet. Uh, the game came in this really large metal tin, and most of the components are not in English. But um, I do have some components in English to swap in and out, and I have English rules that were also sent to me. So this is one I am hoping to try and get played at some point in the near future. Uh, moving on, we have Raids, which is a new game from Yellow, which I picked up uh, from them um, as a press copy from a meeting with them at Origins. I play this one a couple times now, and I cover this one in my impressions, and I, I really quite like this game. Uh, moving on, we have Sierra West. Uh, now, this one is a, a game I specifically got because it's a pre-production copy. It's coming out at Gen Con, and I'm doing a tutorial and playthrough for it. Now, depending on when you're watching this, I might have actually published that already. I fully filmed and edited that yesterday 
yesterday, um, but you have no idea what day it actually is when I'm filming this. Uh, but that one's definitely in the hopper, and that's going to be coming out soon. Um, I covered my impressions of this one um, after I went to Gamma. So that was in, I guess, the March variety vlog, if you're curious, uh, or the March impressions vlog, if you're curious to see my impressions of that one, or just watch the playthrough if that one's out. Definitely check to see if it is. Um, moving on, we have Space Explorers, which is, I think, the only game I bought at Origins. It was relatively cheap, and it has this wonderful art um, as you are trying to go throughout the space race back in the 60s. It's got some tableau building, it's got some engine building. Um, I played it once at two players, and I did not cover my impressions of it yet because I really want to try this one at a higher player count before I do. It was fine at two players, but I think it's going to be a lot better at a higher player count. Uh, next up, we have The Ruhr, which is a uh, the Capstone Games release of, I think it was Ruhrschafart? Ruhrschafart, something like that. I can't speak German. Uh, but this is in their, um, uh, it's a kind of a trilogy of games all about coal production. Now, I played a demo of this at Gen Con two years ago, and I thought it looked pretty neat, uh, but I never had a chance really to play this one again. And while I was at the Victory Point flea market, uh, somebody asked if they were interested in one of my games, and I cannot for the life of me remember which one it was. And they were like, do you want to come over to my collection and see if there's anything to trade for it? And I said, yeah. So I went over there and had the Ruhr and I said, sure, this seems like a great opportunity to get a copy of this game to finally play a full version of it. Honestly, it was two years ago. I barely remember anything about the game. I think there might have been dice as markers in it. You're going down a river. <laughs> I know that. Um, and so um, I haven't played this one fully yet, but I'm hoping to in the future. Uh, next up, we have Tuki. And this one, uh, I got from Plan B Games. Uh, they uh, This is a kind of real-time stacking game, but it's not really dexterity. It's more of a puzzly game. Um, I actually played this one a couple times, and I forgot to cover my impressions of it, so I'm going to cover my impressions of it in the next impressions vlog. And at this point, I realize my list is actually flawed. I have gotten 26 new games because uh, uh, Plan B Games also gave me Century A New World. Obviously, in alphabetical order, I should have talked about this way at the front, but I'm just now realizing there is an error over here in uh, my uh, consolidated all of these in here. Uh, this is the the, uh, the third in the trilogy of Century Games. The first one was Spice Road. The second one was Eastern Wonders. And I have covered my impressions of this one already in the uh, most recent impressions vlog, so definitely check that out. It's a worker placement style game of trying to upgrade your various resources and try to get points from them. Uh, the last one on this list is Yinzi, and this is the newest game that came out from Spielworks. Um, I bought this game, I picked it up through the Board Game Geek Store because that's the main way that you can get these games fulfilled in the United States. It was not cheap. I think it was like $95 or so, and I played this one once at three players, and I talked about it extensively in my last Impressions vlog. So uh, definitely, if you're curious about this one, it's a heavyweight game with a really neat card and worker placement action selection mechanism, and it also has has this really bonkers kind of resource chain where things start out small, they turn into raw goods. They, they, when they're small, they're yours. When they're raw goods, they're not yours. Then you could use other people's raw goods and your factories to turn it into commodities, which are yours. It's, it's a bonkers game, and I talk about it a lot in the last Impressions vlog, so definitely go check that out. At this point, I would normally talk about the games that are leaving my collection, but again, I had just barely enough room to shove all 25 of these games back in, or I guess 26 games. Uh, so at this point, I'm not going to talk about removing any, but because I haven't. Uh, that's going to start happening again in a few weeks, I'm pretty sure. As I start playing through more of the new games that I have and I enjoy those games, I'm going to want to put them into the collection, which means things are going to have to come out. But either way, that's going to bring us to the end of the shifting shelf, and we can now move into the last segment, which is the upcoming schedule for the channel. Now, looking forward at the next four weeks, uh, it looks like um, in this week, week 28, we obviously have this update coming out, and then a full playthrough for Sierra West. Um, and now that I'm thinking about it again, yes, the Sierra West will not be out when this first publishes. This is going to be coming out at the very tail end of this week. Uh, moving on to the next week, I am planning on putting out my uh, Games Radar uh, vlog, where I talk about the new games that I've learned about for the last well, about eight weeks now because I didn't do one last month. And then I am also going to be doing a full tutorial and playthrough for a game called Hats. Now, this is a lightweight card game, kind of set collection card game that's coming out from Thundergriff Games, and it's going to be a Gen Con release. So I'm going to try to get this one out just a couple weeks before Gen Con, and I will possibly do a live Q&A. Now, I think that's somewhat unlikely, just looking at the overall schedule. Um, that might happen in the week after that, or that might just get scrapped for this month. I, I really can't be sure at this moment. There's too many moving parts. Um, 
Uh, so let's now move on to week 30. And this is the week of Gen Con. Now in this week, I am hoping to put out a tutorial and playthrough for the Empires of the North. This is the new release coming out from Portal Games. Um, there is, I guess, the tiniest, slightest chance that I might get this one out in the week prior to that, but I haven't actually received the game in the mail yet, and I'm not sure when it's going to show up, so I'm hoping it shows up in time to get all the filming done that I need to get done. Now, um, in the week uh, 30, I'm also planning on putting out the bonus video for uh, the Patreon supporters, specifically from the contributing supporters of the channel. Um, those are the people who uh, generously donate $20 a month to the channel, and they get to request and then vote on a bonus video. And right now, it's looking like that's probably going to be Gaia Project or Keeper. Now, uh, that's obviously, those are both somewhat heavy games, Gaia Project being much heavier. And if it does end up being Gaia Project, then this might also get bumped back a week because that one's probably going to take me two to maybe three days to film. Um, in week uh, 30, I'm also planning on putting out the standard Patreon-sponsored playthrough. Uh, this one is voted on by everyone who supports this channel at $5 a, a month or more. And this one is currently looking like it's probably going to be Space Explorers. Uh, Undaunted um, is like one vote back, and it looks like Fresco is actually in a strong position as well. There's still like four days left on the poll, so that could go either way. I'm curious to see which one that ends up being. Uh, and then in week 31, I am going to put out my impressions vlog for all of the new games I play in July, which I can already tell you is like five or six new games. Uh, that's because a couple of the games I should have covered last month are going to get covered then. Um, I'll also put out a new update vlog for the month of July, and then I'm going to be putting out a uh, tutorial and playthrough for Periodic. Now, this one is coming out from Genius Games, and I had a really productive meeting with them at Origins and discussed potentially covering some of their games. Um, so this is going to be the first one of those. So I'll be putting that one out that week. Um, the, this one specifically, you have a periodic table on as your board, and you play the game on top of the periodic table. So um, I've not actually played this one yet. I just kind of saw a brief overview of it. So I'm looking forward to getting into that one more. And then, of course, you know, making a tutorial and playthrough and uh, sharing it with everybody. So that's the uh, general schedule that I'm looking at for the next four weeks. Obviously, a couple of these things are a little bit uh, flexible as uh, things are coming uh, uh, coming soon. And obviously, many of these videos are uh, trying to get out before Gen Con because that's just a big push point. And I'm going to try to make all of that happen. Uh, so at this point, we have have now reached the end of this update vlog. It was a little bit longer than I anticipated. I think I talked about Origins for longer than I expected, and certainly talking about 26 new games, even if I try to be brief, well, that just takes a while. So in general, I hope you have enjoyed this vlog, and I think we've come to the end. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.